Are you ready? Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Can't wait! This, this, this is Mock on the Mic on the A1 Sports Network. Bow to the masters. Break it down! Hi, this is Chris Komazuski, founder and president of the A1 Sports Network, also producer of the Moffat on the Mic podcast. Today, we interviewed actress and model Christine Wen, but due to technical difficulties, the first 10 minutes of our interview with Christine have gone missing. But we hope you enjoy the rest of our interview with Christine. Here you go. Um, just uh, on another note, so tell us about your new movie, um, Companion. Um, like I said, it was a sci-fi movie. Um, when is it going to be out? Is it just going to be more on a streaming service? Is it... Um... Um, so Companion is our sci-fi movie. It's sci-fi thriller, and it's the brainchild of director John Darbone. I've done a couple of other things with him, like Cottages, you know. Um, he did, um, just, he did, he's really into the sci-fi and the gore. If you ever see a John Darbone production, mm -hmm. expect a lot of blood, okay. a lot of mayhem, and as many weapons as you can think of, you know. <laughs> um, but that's his genre, and it's, it's amazing, and it's, it's basically... It's almost kind of true to life. You know how they always have the zombie apocalypse? Yeah. Well, the thing behind Companion is um, it's th all these characters that you see, these crazy characters that Erica Obar, um, amazing makeup artist, special effects artist out of Oklahoma, and she came in to help us with this. And as you noticed, um, on my page, it shows all the characters. And right. she never made one companion. Those are the scary people. She never made one that looked like another one. So hats off to her first. But basically, it's about the world's coming to an end. Um, kind of like, you know, the Fear of the Walking Dead, all these zombie apocalypse. And there's only a couple of survivors. And basically, human nature and humanity, how we interact with each other. Are we going to be against each other or for each other? There's always going to be the dark people, you know, who are all about themselves. They're going to be about people who are going to help other people. And they're going to be about people who are really scared when these things happen. And it builds on fear. And um, fear, basically, um, is your companion through life, right? right? That's your companion. So these we're not zombies. We're your companions. Um, and, you know, like with anything, sometimes there's this life and there's that life. And there's a life, the land of the living, and there's a land of the, those who aren't living. These are the companions and the fear. And right. where is it to where they take you over so much? Mm -hmm. Because they only come out when you have fear in yourself. So will they will get to the point where they take you over so much? Will they take over humanity so much that it's just companions? Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. So that's the premise <laughs> of the show. So it's, it's pretty creepy and it's scary and people have fear in so many different ways, you know? The fear for their life, fear for their loved ones, the fear of the supernatural, fear of death, fear of getting hurt, fear of no food, no money, no clothing, no shelter. So it's a really deep um, movie. So um, I'm excited for it. Word on the street is that it'll be done um, in post-production by August, but you know, like with everything that's going on, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but cross our fingers, it'll be you know, around sounds, August. Sounds like a great project. Yeah, and I will definitely let everybody know, and I'll blare it out on the horn when it is. But I appreciate you asking about it, because it's something we did and we're so proud of. Can't wait to watch it. Now, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's gory, right? <laughs> All right, now I'll transfer it over to, you know, Colin Kaepernick. Do you think he'll get signed to a team this season? Or, and if, you, if he does, do you, do you think – what team do you think will get – he get signed to? I'm going to tell you what. If he gets signed to the Patriots, woo! That'll, that'll – you know, that'll be a good thing because I think that um, Belichick has always been good with taking something that's controversial. I mean, they had a murderer on the team, you know, yeah. after the Super Bowl. So it's like if, there, if there's any organization that can take something that is very um, – um, has a lot of notoriety and bring it down a notch and bring it back to football. I really think that it's the Patriots organization. Um, I think they're ready for, I mean, he's still young, you know, he's amazing. And I think he's a, a breath of fresh air to restart. It's almost like a new beginning for him and a new beginning for the Patriots. Um, and I think that it's just so weird that, you know, everything that he said years before, I can't remember what year it was, 2017 or something like that. You know, he talked about, 
um, police brutality, you know, and he talked about Black Lives Matter. And people stayed away from him, shied away from him because they said it was a business a decision, right? I think to myself, this would be a great business decision again, turn it the way, other way around. Think about his jersey. That's going to be the number one jersey, right? Yeah. For NFL lovers, football lovers alike. And then people who just, you know, this Black Lives Matter, everything that's happened has affected them. That's going to be the number one jersey on the market. So we're talking business. This is going to be a good business for whoever gets them on their team. <laughs> now for kind of piggyback off Clem's question, when we were talking about Kaepernick last week on the show, the one thing I said was, if you're going to sign him, I hope you're signing him for his ability on the field and not because you feel bad about what happened a few years ago. So if a team signs him at this point, in your opinion, do you think it will be more for the former or more for like the latter? And on that note, bringing in a guy like Kaepernick is going to be a lot of fanfare, which is going to require additional security at games. You're going to be doing PR. Yeah. So do the ends justify the means at the end of the day, I guess, in bringing in a guy like Colin Kaepernick to your team who will basically be a backup quarterback? I don't know if he'll be a starter. Yeah, I don't think it could hurt, you know, and if it can't hurt your team and the only thing it could do is help your team, mm -hmm. I would say he is a win-win situation, you know. I, I mean, you know, you got a good bench then, you know, you got a great backup quarterback. Um, you're supporting something that is a social is issue, a world issue, mm -hmm. and – once again, you know, you, you can pay for things you did in the past, but we can't keep on looking at the past. We can only move towards the future and what you do to make the future better. And of course, it'll be, you know, it's like, it, I doubt they'll say it's to make up for anything, you know, because he is talented. Now, were he not to be talented, that'd be another thing. That's kind of like, okay, we're sorry, you know, here's, here's our freebie. Let, let's throw you a bone. But this guy is talented, you know? So, I mean, you can only help yourself. So, yeah, I don't think it's going to be anything about making up. I don't think, like, NFL owners are really always big on, like, you know, the apologies and making up for something or doing something else. So it's all going to be about dollars and cents and then um, ability, you know, yeah. and to get to that Super Bowl. Oh, absolutely. And um, I think I'm going to steal Craig's question here. Um, I want to get your thoughts on what Drew Brees said about kneeling for the national anthem. Yeah, so I was surprised that he said what he said, too. But I think, you know, um, it is a knee-jerk reaction when you are not – when you are not in the middle of um, something that's happening, if you are not affected by it, you know, and if you don't know, I mean, of course, you know, he is in New Orleans and everything, but he is um, a white male. And so he might not feel as easily something, you know, that the African-American population feels and African-American feels. And I think that it's unfortunate that he did what he did on such a social platform, but I think it's, it, it, it spurred debate and it spurred conversation and it showed him mm -hmm. um, what his fellow teammates felt and what a good part of the population feels. And I think the fact that everybody came out so fast against what he said. And the thing is, what he said, I get it. You honor the American flag. I'm an immigrant. I honor the American flag because I got here and I got to make a great life for myself, right? So what he said had validity. However, it was not the right thing to say during this time because it had nothing to do with the issue at hand. Yeah. You know, um, how you feel about your country, that has nothing to do with it right now. It, it's, it's about, you know, people living in this country and what they're going through. And I think it's just an unfortunate that his comment came and it was more white noise. It detracted from what was this, the issue at hand. And that was that um, people of color, um, pointedly African Americans, you know, were being treated differently and losing their lives unnecessarily. And I think that once people came out against him, he was very quick mm -hmm. um, to retract what he said and apologize for it. And I watched, you know, like Shannon Sharp go off on him and, and the fact that he pointedly reached out to these people to let them know. And hearing the way he reached out and, you know, you have to see a person's emotions, not just like a text or a tweet. Yeah. Um, you can really feel that we can't, you know, um, we can't tarnish a man's reputation just by one thing he said, because his track record, I think, of being in New Orleans and everything he's done for the community and how he feels about his teammates, I think overshadowed that. So I think it's a pass for him that he came up very quickly and said that. 
you know. But it was unfortunate that um, it added to the white noise of the problem at hand. That's what I was saying to to Clem when we, we were talking about it last week was it wasn't the fact of what he said. Mm-hmm. It was really just the timing. The timing yeah. to me was just brutally bad because yeah. that's not what people wanted to hear at that moment. And it just really triggered a firestorm at that point. And I'll always respect what Drew Brees' opinion is. I'll respect what anybody's opinion is. This is what we, this is the country we live in. You have every right to believe what you want to believe. I may not agree with it, but you have, you know, you have your way of saying things or opinion and I have mine. But I think at the end of the day, I didn't have a problem with what he said. Like I said, I just think the timing of it was just really poor. Right. We were just literally in the, it was, it was just getting progressively worse with each passing day with the protests. And then, then the story with the tear gassing in Lafayette Park in Washington came about. And then he just kind of added to it. And that's the last thing people wanted to hear at that particular moment. But right. Drew Brees has done it. Like you said, Drew Brees has done a ton for the community of New Orleans. And I think he even donated $5 million to, for he's the homeless, you know, I mean, he's really put a lot back into his community and that's a lot more you can say for some people when they get, um, you know, that platform to be able to do something good. Um, but you know, you know, I always feel like anything bad that happens, not that my life is lost, but when something bad happens and it spurs an outrage or it spurs some kind of conversation or debate, that's good mm-hmm. because it maybe makes other people who might've thought like him, take a step back and think, you know, I might be wrong too. This is not the issue at hand, you know, maybe I'm fighting for the wrong reason right now. Maybe I'm fighting, maybe I'm fighting wrongly in all respects right now. So for the fact that it happened, I'm happy that it opened up conversation. It opened up conversation on so many, you know, it opened up conversation politically um, on the sports, you know, um, stage. And it was, it's good that, People saw one point of view and then he was able to come back and maybe change people's minds. Yeah, and I think it opened up his mind a little bit too yeah. when he realized it, especially when his teammates kind of called him out on it. I think he understood it a lot more. And again, more respect for Drew Brees even after what he said. It's, you know, I don't expect him to change his mind completely. And he's free to believe that, you know, kneeling for the flag is he's not in favor of, but he also understands from the other perspective. And I think that's kind of the, that's the whole point of getting it to that point today. Totally. So um, obviously the other big story during the football off season was of course, Tom Brady. Oh yeah. Tampa. So I'm such a huge Tom Brady fan, you know, and I really shouldn't be because they, it was one of the worst, I think, in my opinion, Super Bowls ever because it was so boring. <laughs> that, was, that was a very rough Super Bowl to sit through. It was like, it, it, it was horrendous. And it was like at my birthday party because I always share my birthday seriously. It's either on Super Bowl, the day before Super Bowl, the day after Super Bowl. And so I've got always piggybacks. So I want it to be a fun time, but it was like, this was a snoozer, right? And plus, doubly because it was with the Rams. And I'm like, oh my God, if the Rams can just beat the Patriots, this would be the Jared best present Goff. ever. Jared Goff just looked totally overmatched in that game just from the defensive, you know, he just really had a tough time. But with Tom Brady now in Tampa, how much pressure is there on him to win a Super Bowl this year without Belichick? Oh my gosh. Um, huge, you know. And now I'm going to say he's a goat already. But if he can do that, but then he's got his buddy, his partner in crime, stepping yeah. out of retirement just to come in and help him out, you know? So it's like the terrible duo are back back on, you know, back on the gridiron. So I think it's going to be a great year for Tampa. I think Brady, I'm just a huge fan of Brady just because, like, I was listening to a commencement speech he did um, for um, a school up in uh, New England. And everything that comes out of this man's mouth shows that he ate, he eats, he lives, he breathes football and he breathes being a winner, you know? And it's like, it's, it's weird too, because, um, like I, I watched the last dance, you know, and I was watching how, it that, that was so good. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> go ahead. You can, I mean, it's something we haven't seen before, obviously, with with all the Bulls highlights from the past and stuff. Yeah, but you know what was good? I mean, it's, it's a, 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 a sojourn on this, but it's like, um, it wasn't just about Michael Jordan. That was the best part. Yeah. Like every episode kind of highlighted somebody else, like um, mm-hmm. Rodman. I never knew Rodman was like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Pippen, um, Kerr, it was great because it, it, it showed you everything that happened you know, during that amazing run that he had. And then to see these other people go off in these other avenues, you know, it's like greatness begets greatness, right? Um, But going back to Tom Brady, he's just, 
I think he's really going to make an impact. I definitely think they're going to make the playoffs and I think they're going to make um, the conference finals, you know, mm -hmm. um, depending on who, I don't know. Like he's, you know, Tampa's not always been up there, so he's got a lot to work with. Um, but I think they believe in him and I think that his players will have so much respect for him as the captain that they're going to give a hundred percent or 150, you know, because I mean, if it, there's going to be a year that would stand out so much. Their expectations would, are going to be very high in Tampa. Oh time. yeah. But think about this though. Haven't they always been for him, you know, after winning four, after winning three, you know, to it's win funny. it again, the MVP again. It's funny you mentioned like how you're a big Brady fan. Cause I actually know people who are paid, who were Patriot fans when he was there. Uh -huh. but huge Tom Brady fans like they really like Tom Brady more than the team yeah, yeah. Uh, now all of a sudden they're kind of you know shifting towards Tampa because he's in Tampa now that's, how that's, much that's a testament that's a testament to what an amazing individual he is right mm -hmm. you, that and that's not bad too because he doesn't leave I don't think he leaves any ill will with the Patriots you know yeah. I mean I'm sure a lot of people hate to see him go in New England but they can't like, you know, not wish him well for moving on because this is good for him too, you know? And um, for everything that he stands for, the winner attitude, never. And the thing is, it's not like he was a number one draft pick. This guy in college at Michigan, even in the, in the NFL, he had to wait for that opportunity. He was always on the bench waiting for that opportunity. And it's a testament to anyone doing anything. If you, you ready for it, you know, it's like um, you better be ready when opportunity knocks. It's yeah. so true, you know? And so, I mean, he's going to do really great. And I love that everyone's like, you know, really rooting for him. I think so. I mean, not Patriots fans. They still love him, but they're not rooting for him, you know? <laughs> we'll find out soon enough how good they are, if it really was a product of Belichick, or is it more Brady's just overall talent? I mean. Totally. This will be nice to see this. Yeah. yeah. So, I think we can all agree 2020 has been a shit show so far. Um, <laughs> but what unfortunately started off, this terrible year was the death of Kobe Bryant. Now, oh. sitting there, yeah, now since you're in LA, and you know, I wanted to just get your opinion on what it was, what it was like being in LA <laughs> when Kobe Bryant passed. What the people of Los Angeles felt like, et cetera, and whatnot. You know, that was like that was surreal. It was weird because um, I remember it was uh, God, it was I can't remember exactly what day of the week it was, Saturday or Sunday. It was and Sunday. I think, it broke like Sunday. That, it was a Sunday yeah, morning and you know, it's like, um, you're already kind of groggy. And I remember getting a text message saying, Oh my God, Kobe's dead. And I was like, what? And I'm like, Oh, it's another one of these, you know, Facebook hoax or whatever. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought, so, it was. Was thought it was actually. Totally. Yeah, somebody totally. Thought it was, and then posted it, they thought it was a hoax. That's right. Yeah. And so I go, you know, I didn't go on Facebook, but I, I went on, you know, I, I just put in Kobe Bryant death. And then when I saw the helicopter, they had the helicopter um, footage. That's when I'm like, wow, I think this is real, you know? And it mm -hmm. just hit us. And then right away it was confirmed. And it was just, it was just a solemn moment, I think, because, you know, with anyone dying, it's a solemn moment. But, but this is someone who was so known in the community and was just beginning a new episode of his life, like the second act of his life, you know? had so much more to give. He was still going out there and really inspiring people um, to do great things. And then the fact that his daughter was with him, you know, and the fact that all these other families were with him too. It was just a moment. It just made you stop. It just made you think, God, life has just gone like that. Yeah. No one's guaranteed anything, no matter how famous you are, how talented you are, how much money you have. Yeah. It's gone just like that. And yeah. makes you sit back and think about your life and everyone around you, you know. But the crying of love, the outpouring of appreciation for him was amazing. Within days, there were murals all over the city. Um, you saw, like, at the Staples Center, you know, all the, the beautiful memorial they did for him. And then watching his teammates and everyone that had interacted with him, down to, like, talk show hosts, mm -hmm. how big an impact he had on the community and on the way people thought and what a winner should be. It was, it was solemn, super solemn. I mean, people were crying, you know? It makes me sad. It makes me, like, tear up to think about it again, too, you know? Because added to everything that's bad, I mean, 2020 was supposed to be the year of, like, 
clear vision, you know, <laughs> chokes on us, right? Yeah. We, were <laughs> we were like, all right, 2020, this is it. Then Kobe. We always say that on January 1st, and then it's just like, then all of a sudden the bottom drops out, and then you're just miserable because the Kobe Bryant. It's like, don't make a New Year's Eve, like, um, resolution. Just do it. Don't say it. Yeah, do I it. that a long time ago. <laughs> we are talking to Christine Wynn on the Moffat on the Mic show. Um, thank you again, Christine, for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, always. I always love coming on here with you. You guys are fun. <laughs> okay, so one of the stories that's probably going to be lost in the shuffle with the with the pandemic and obviously the Black Lives Matter movement is the fact that, and we talked about this when you were on my show last time, was about the um, the new stadium that's going to be opening up for the Rams and Chargers this year for the 2020 season. Now, when we talked the last time, it was kind of funny because you had said that there really was little to no excitement for the Chargers. Yeah. Was, you know, when we were watching the games and they were playing in the soccer stadium, it was predominantly a visiting team. Stadium. Yeah. Has that changed at all going into this year? I mean, I know pretty much with football kind of right now, just still on the off season and everything, it's hard to say, but I was just curious from your perspective as we get closer and closer to the new stadium opening up, has the excitement level for the Chargers changed? Are they really going to be playing second fiddle to a team like the Rams in that stadium? You know what? Um, like right now, I still don't hear. And the thing is, I'm <laughs> um, like you said, it has really gotten lost in the shuffle because that should be like the big buzz right now in L.A., the new stadium and everything. And I think the only buzz we ever get is when we fly over it coming back to L.A. We're like, oh, my God, that's our new stadium. Will we ever see it? We don't know, you know. Um, <laughs> But I do think it is. It's just, you just don't – I just – going around L.A., I just don't feel that buzz about the Chargers, which is very sad, you know, because it's going to be another one of our home teams. I think it's going to be very seriously back – like, back, remember back in the L.A. Clippers days? Like, yeah. Clippers. About the Clippers was all about the Clippers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other team that plays, you know, at the, the yeah. Staples Center or whatever. I feel like it's going to be that way for a little while until like the Clippers, they make a big buzz. You know? And the sad thing is they have been doing, they've had that really great seasons, right? Um, okay. The Clippers have been much better now, especially. With oh my them. God. The Clippers are, there's Clipper nation now. So I think the chargers, well, let's see how this season goes. If they just have a rocking season, I think LA is very, we're really good about, you know, holding court on two like levels, you know? Yeah. It's just hard, too, because a lot of the Chargers um, really diehard fans were from San Diego, mm -hmm. and San Diego is very upset with the Chargers for leaving. And so, um, but they're still a good predominantly, you know, I, I, a lot of my friends still wear the Chargers, you know, like yeah. um, jerseys out, you know, the girls are always wearing it out and we're, you know, happy about it. But I think they're going to need to make a huge splash. And then with, you know, Philip Rivers, too, it's like, well, you yeah. know, yeah, start fresh point. again. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was that. He was like, you know, he was a franchise player. And so now what? You know? tell that Brady may go there as yeah. part of the stadium and stuff, but I guess it was never really even remotely considered by him. I, just think he, I guess it was either Tampa or maybe back to New England. But, yeah, uh, I didn't see that happening either just because, too, I think that um, – I think he's very smart the way he did things. You know, he wanted to go somewhere where he could totally be, you know, he didn't want to go in. Like the Rams already have a great team, right? Yeah. And so in the Chargers, he'd be competing with already a great team. I think, I think he wanted the spotlight on where he was going to go and he wanted a team he could really work with, you know, and also a city where he could start a buzz. Yeah. LA's got so much a buzz with so many other things going. He could easily that get lost sense. in the shuffle here, you know? All right. Do you think baseball will happen this year? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to happen. Um, Flynn, like, stop stealing my questions. What's that? Flynn, stop stealing my questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he, he's got so much time between our first questions. He's like thinking of ways to step in. No, I, I think baseball is going to happen. I don't think there's any way that any of these sports, I mean, they make too much money, you know? I mean, how can – and the owners, they've got to make their money somehow, right? And so it's going to happen. Um, how it's going to happen, I can totally see, though. I mean, it's going to take a lot of work on administrative side. But I say it's kind of like with the restaurants, you know? You want to social distance. Um, but if you know the people that you're coming with enough, then you need to be able to sit with them. So it's going to be a lot on administrative side. If you come with a group of 10, that group should be able to sit together. I mean, you pre-buy your tickets anyway, so you know where you're sitting. So you go in and Southwest free for all, you know. Um, but that's going to take a lot of work. Um, 
or we can do it like what was it what's that league that they're selling tickets but only to have a picture of you in the seat I don't know. well it might be uh well the korean baseball league is korean, like, korean, korean league baseball organization. they put um like cardboard cutouts of people in the stands just to kind of get that feel get of that like, feel yeah i mean i think joe buck was talking about how they were going to maybe pipe in like um, the crowd sound, just to give the players some kind of feel to it. I mean, that's something that they were talking about in some Zoom interview with like Joe Buck and some people on ESPN. But I do think baseball is going to start up. It's the longest season of the year. So I think them, they have the most leeway to think this out. And if anything, you know, um, make it happen. Now, with that, do you think it's more because the one with these whole baseball negotiations, the one thing I don't really hear about anymore is the health risk. For yeah. the I, it just seems to be more geared towards money and getting financially compensated and stuff. And I'm not saying players don't shouldn't get paid. I definitely think they should. But is this something that you think that people we're in a, currently in 13% unemployment? Do they really want to hear from 30 million dollar athletes mm-hmm. that they're making only 10 million? Totally. Or 10 million, maybe less than what I'll see for the rest of my lifetime. Yeah. Right. So, um, tell me that's more than you get on some lottos, <laughs> some state lottos. Thank you very much. Um, is, I mean, are the players really concerned about the health at the, the risk factors, or is this just more about getting paid, in your opinion? Um, you know what? It's like my thing is with every professional sports, you're away from your family, right? Mm-hmm. Probably most of the season. And so, you know, it would be one thing if you're going to play and then you're coming home that night, you know, and you're seeing your family, then you have to quarantine or be in a bubble for 14 days after every game. But what I said, think is a lot of these players, and I'm not poo-pooing anything, everyone's got their own thing, but yeah, you're right. I don't think that they want to hear about, you know, oh, I'm going to be able to make just so much money. And for those of them who feel like they're going to be quarantined, I mean, they're with their team most of the season and they don't see their wives, their children, their girlfriends you know, for most of the season anyway. So um, it's just, it's a different lifestyle. You know, when they do have time off now, they might not be able to go home. They'll have to, you know, and that's a thing too. They're human as well, right? And they worry about their families and it's, it'll be hard because the, um, their family that come out to see them or maybe usually stay with them will not be able to do so. So I feel for them as well. But as far as like making less money, you, you made more money than most of us anyways. And so I don't think most of America wants to hear that. You know? <laughs> so. now, well, now to go back to Tom Brady, I saw you watched the match between Tiger Woods, Bill Mickelson, Peyton Manning, and Tom Brady. How was it? I actually didn't get to watch it. I only saw highlights, but how was it? I'm surprised as much as anybody else is that I would ever watch anything golf related. And I remember that day too. I was like, I wanted to start from the very beginning. You know, and my boyfriend was like, no, nah, yeah, we can start from maybe like the 14th hole or something. <laughs> you know, we don't have to sit through the whole thing. Um, I give them all the credit in the world, but I just, I've tried to watch golf like little by little. It is a very tough watch. It's just, oh, yeah. Especially at home. I guess maybe being, I don't even know if being there makes it any better. Yeah. But, um, it's probably it's drunk. A tough watch for me. So. I'm thinking most people are drinking. It's more like a, like some of like social thing, but yeah, there's not a lot of like back and forth action, but. I have to say I enjoyed it just because the town, I feel Mickelson. I didn't know much about him at all. Wow. What? I mean, I get it now. He is good. And the best part about him, he was good. I was like, I can't hit like to be able to hit like that far, you know? And the the best thing about him, he was so, he was such a good um, uh, mentor, you know, from Brady because Brady was not having the best day until the birdie, you know, yeah. uh, but he was such a good mentor as seeing, seeing him kind of coach Brady and what he should be doing or, Hey man, that, that was great, but I do it this way. That was really cool. And then just Peyton Manny, anything comes out of his mouth. It's just great. He's just so much fun to watch no matter what, no matter if it's like, you know, commercial or him on the field or, you know, him on the greens. So it was Eli, a lot of fun. Eli Manning was also kind of tweeting during the match. Oh, he was yeah, totally <laughs> talking crap. <laughs> yeah, so I actually, I mean, I've always been a fan of the Manning brothers just from that perspective, just because they're actually pretty funny guys when they're not playing football. And they're, yeah. The Peyton Manning Saturday Night Live show, I think, is one of the best ones I've ever seen. Totally. But just like him and Eli just kind of giving Brady a lot of crap for it. I thought, it was, I thought that was actually pretty funny. That was fun. And then, I mean, like the ripped pants and you can, I mean, this, this was like, this was like the best ever like golf um, tournament I've ever watched. I mean, I'm never going to see that again, probably. Right. Um, and then the storms and everything and how they played through it, but it was a lot of fun. And I also want to give um, 
like props that they didn't make that 20 million, but mm -hmm. you know, they, the network stepped up and like they contributed and they made that 20 million for charity. So I thought that was really cool. I think it was a breath of fresh air to watch anything live too that was happening, right. you know? Like anything the fact that it was anything. people from different sports doing it. I think it just gave someone like, oh, there's something live to watch, even if it's golf. <laughs> like I was saying to Clint, like last week, I was watching the Major League Baseball draft. I've never watched it before in my life. It's not yeah. the most entertaining thing, but I didn't care because it was just a live sports thing to watch. Can and I ask you guys, have they crazy. ever made it live before? They it's do live, but it was more, but like you don't really watch it because it's not the most interesting. And most of the ah, guys take like yeah. five years to get to base to Major League Baseball. So yeah. it's like the NFL draft where the guys pretty much you draft them number one overall and they're starting week one. That's where the excitement is. For baseball, it's very different because some of these guys are fresh out of high school. Some of them are, you know, they're committed to college and they may not sign. So it's just kind of like it was just that live sports thing I needed, I guess. It's just yeah. what it was. Well, good for them, though, that they got this, like, oomph, you know? It's like, oh, my gosh, everyone's interested in what I'm doing. I mean, it's great whenever you're, like, in a position where you feel, like, wanted, you know, and mm -hmm. at the beginning of their career, too. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Now, back to, um, unfortunately, there was a little bit of a dose of reality we got today, and that was Ezekiel Elliott tested positive for COVID-19. Oh, gosh, I haven't even looked at the news today oh, yet. I'm sorry. Well, well breaking news. <laughs> yeah. Ow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it was like Ezekiel Elliott and a few players on the Texans apparently also tested positive. I don't know if they were doing a joint workout. I don't know what it was. Now that you hear that, though, in a way, just with everything, with the NFL basically saying we're going to start on schedule, everything's going to start on schedule, do you think something like this will give them pause to start on time? Yeah, well, now this kind of throws a wrench into everything, right? Because you can start the season, but then it's like, what if half your players get taken out? But as with everything, um, that's why you have a bench, you know? And yeah. it's very unfortunate. And the thing is, you know, you can test positive for it, but if your immune system is strong enough, because there have been a lot of people that have tested positive that didn't even know they had it. Yeah. So it's all about your immune system. And hopefully, I mean, these players, you know, they work out hard. They eat right. They have nutritionists. They have people, you know, constantly monitoring their health. So I think that with the resources they, that they have, if they test positive for it, hopefully um, they're able to overcome it, quarantine themselves, you know, catch it fast enough, retrace whatever, how yeah, the, the retracing, or I can't remember the name for it. Um, yeah, so um, I think that they have everything in their power to overcome these obstacles. Um, being that, you know, they're healthy individuals. Pro athletes usually are very healthy. They have a great immune system. And the immune system is a big part of this, right? It's attacking people who are a bit weaker, the, the elderly. So um, it'll give pause. But like I said, there's a bench. And not making light of the situation. Bench players, second, third, you know, third string. I like the way you think. Be ready. Yeah, we all want football back. Okay. I don't know if we could go through a fall of no football. That's, that's going to be tough. I know. I was already like, already without pandemic, you know, it's like summer is kind of crazy for me. So I'm like before, you know, the playoffs for baseball, I'm kind of like, oh, what am I going to do on Sundays? I mean, like another like Netflix night, you know, <laughs> I'm ready too. Um, one thing I saw you watched, and it's considered one of the greatest fights of all time, is the Zhang uh, Weili, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, and the Joanna Yunjaisic fight. Oh, how dude, how dude, good was that? I did it last that was week. so good. That was so good. So we watched um, the golf, you know, tournament, yeah. and then jonesing for more sports. And so we're on um, uh, ASPN, and then they replayed that fight. And I kid you not, I was like, wow. And I'm telling you, the UFC women's title fights sometimes are so much better than the men's because they yes. just at, at it. They go, and it was so good because these girls gave it their all. And, oh, Johanna, it's like, oh, my God. Like, that was like that. She's one of my favorite fighters, and I didn't even recognize her after the fight. Yeah, it's totally. Like Shout out to Joanna, one of my good yeah. friends in um, Poland, Warsaw, is, um, uh, works out with her a lot. So yeah. shout out to Tomek and Joanna. You, she looks so good. I hope you've healed. But yeah, that fight was ridiculous. It was so good. And it's just the heart, you know. And speaking of UFC, they're like the first to come out, you know. It's a whole fight island. Not fight. What is it? There's another name for the island. But um, they're yeah. one of the first to be able to come yeah. out. And see, and the funny thing is I've watched one of um, – the uh one of their pay-per-views before with no crowd and 
for them, it actually works, you know? I feel yeah. like it might even give them more um, clarity during their fight. They have their teams and their, their, um, their you know, team members on the side that spur them on. And it also, I think it gives them um, more focus on each other. You know, so it might be a good thing. But the thing is, the big thing with UFC, right, that Dana White always talks about is the gate. No gate now. (laughs) All right, I'm going to jump back into um, movies really quickly because um, I kind of just caught this article before you came on. uh, We start our interview. So a lot of summer movies are being pushed back, basically because with the pandemic, nobody really wants to go to the movies, obviously. So recently, the new Wonder Woman movie is now being moved to October. AMC Movie Chain just kind of came out with an article today saying that they expect 95% of their chain to open by middle of July. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, at the same time, Christopher Nolan's new movie, I'm like a huge fan of Christopher Nolan, um, is going to be coming out on July 31st. So putting that all in there, do you think it's a good, do you think the middle of July is the right time to start opening theaters again to the publics to show movies or is it, kind of uh, maybe it's a little too soon, especially with the fact that not a lot of movies are opening up since everything's literally pushed back to the fall or even next year, or even went to streaming, like automatically went to streaming. you know, personally, I think that things need to start opening up, but at a graduated scale, like at 25%, you know, and you can easily do that with movie theaters when people are buying tickets. I think most people already do that anyways. They buy their tickets and they buy their seats. Mm -hmm. And when you buy it together, you have to start somewhere because if not, if everything starts at one time, it's a funnel, right? And once again, you have a traffic jam and everyone's buying for um, these few, very few certain dates that you have. Like every concert that was put on hold, every festival, everything's gonna be in October, August, and whenever now. That's not good. So we need to start, for those who can absorb it, yeah, maybe you push back a little bit more. But for those who can't, you need to put your, you know, you need to put something out now. Um, it co- all comes down to numbers, you know, mm-hmm. because in the theaters, you're not gonna be able to have a packed theater anymore. It's gonna have to be like a 25 percenter, you know, or a 50 percenter or something. Mm-hmm. And so, but they'll never make the money that they, well, not meant to say never, because Trolls came out and there was that big to do with Universal, yep. you know, NBC and AMC. Um, but they have to make their money somehow with all the marketing promotions and millions are put into making the movie and marketing it. And they have to start somewhere. But I do say, it has to start and it can't all start at one time, um, but it has to start on a graduated scale, just like with restaurants, you know? So I'm happy that they say that, as long as they're able to keep, keep up with the social distancing, you know? Now, one thing, you know, like I mentioned, 2020 has been a huge shit show. It feels like forever ago that Joe Exotic was the big, big story <laughs> in the news. I know you binge watched them, so I want to get your thoughts on Tiger King and everything about it. All right. You caught me. Um, I binged that show in one day. I didn't even really know about it, but for some reason it was just like, see, I love animals. So I was like, Oh, Tiger King didn't really. And then it said, Oh, this is a crazy story. So I, I thought to myself, never knew it was going to be as crazy as it was. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, this is cool. Like an animal kingdom stuff. This guy, like, you know, um, I watched every episode and I just <laughs> shake my head. <laughs> shaking my head moment every episode that's what i was saying like i'm watching every episode because I, like, I kept seeing it on social media and i was like all right i gotta give this show a watch everyone it can't get worse right and it would keep on getting worse <laughs> i'm like it, it like it was like a different story each and every episode and i'm just like what the hell's going on like it's like it wasn't really i wouldn't say it was like a great show but it's like you can't turn away from this like this was you can't it's like a train wreck after a car wreck after an airplane crash after it's just like yeah it's like like, do these people exist in life like these are real people like like this is going on in america like i had no idea this was happening and i'm watching it with like my brother and my parents and they're like, why haven't we heard about any of this? Like, this is crazy. It was just. It's ridiculous. And it's sad, too, because if you watched it, you know, there was a moment that made me. Um, I mean, there's a couple of moments at the end when you learned what was really going on behind yeah. all the shooting. Um, I mean, sh- you know, filming. Um, just the tigers all cramped in, like, you yeah. know, ho- horrible enough that cattle are like that, you know. But the, they're, they're crammed in like that. And the fact that they were getting killed off. You know, yeah, and the fact that these people that do this, they do not care about the animals. Like that crazy woman in Florida that killed her husband. I'm almost 100%. So it's 
say that she killed her husband. She, him. That she killed him. So you bad. never once see her touching any one of her tigers, by the way. Exactly. You never once in the show ever saw her being even close to a tiger. She's the worst person in the world. <laughs> evil. Just evil. And then um, the fact that they were finding the bones and burying them, it was just horrible. But I mean, you know what? If it bleeds, it leads. And uh, and we were <laughs> lucky for them. That, that show might have kind of gotten like, you know, tossed in the Netflix stew too. But because yeah. we're sitting here and we binged everything we could binge, you know? Yeah. And just that the guy himself, he was just so crazy. But you heard, right? He signed on to play him. Who? Nicolas Cage. Oh, oh really? I can totally see that. Oh, I can totally see I that. I can totally see that. I love that. That's right up his alley. Either that or David Spade. I could have seen David Spade too, kind of do it. I won't go see it with David Spade. I, I have, every man has their threshold. <laughs> <laughs> But did you see the reunion? That's the thing. Yeah, I did. Oh, I, I'm glad he got teeth. A lot of people got teeth. He didn't have teeth before. <laughs> like, I just thought it was wild, too. And then, like, they showed this dude, Doc Antel. And I'm like, this guy's running a cult, and no one's talking about it. Like, Oh, like, yeah. Like, he's with young girls. Running, yeah, this guy is running a cult with virgins, and he's, no one is talking about this. I was like. We, this should be news too. Like this should be right. a docu series. Like, but this is in an effed up world. Who's more yeah. effed up? And you, the, the the lesser effed up people are down. It's an effed up scale, right? But that's, yeah. the whole thing is effed up. You know. Oh my god! But just such a wild. <laughs> show. I'm binge watching. I have to put those aside now to watch Tiger King with the way. Gotta give it a watch, man. You gotta. Go yeah, on. I mean it's sad, and I have to say I'm I'm a sad part. So I can watch it. Ah, I, I was under COVID quarantine. I didn't know what else to do with myself. You know. <laughs> This was like, I was hoping it wasn't real, but it was. But, oh, man. The, the fact, too, that he ran for office. Oh, my God. That was oh, so funny. I don't understand why they got the money to do all of this stuff, you know, and they're still, like, they were saying how, um, oh, this grossed me out so much, like, the pizza parlor that they opened, oh they admitted that they were using scraps, you know, that they were looking for to feed, like, the animals, that they were using that in the pizzas for the pizza parts. So, well, everything about that show was just so messed up and wild. I was like, this is, this is terrible, but I can't turn away and stop watching this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it sure shed a light on that whole, like, um, yeah, hot industry that they have, you know? I have a couple of more questions uh, on my end. Um, for starters, as an actress, um, do you tend to take an interest in what goes on behind the scenes with regards to like production, directing, producing, like any of that stuff? Ooh. So many jobs. There's so many jobs. Like and we all forget this because a lot of times we watch a movie, we don't stay for the credits. Yeah. And Shame on you. <laughs> kind of, well, people do it now in Marvel movies because apparently there's always a scene that connects to the next one and the next one after that. But most of the time they don't really have that. So we're always, for, we always forget how many jobs there really are on any movie, even a TV show. Oh my gosh, yeah. As an actress, as a you know, film actress and everything, do you tend to take an interest in what people do behind the scenes as like maybe to eventually, if you were ever given the opportunity to produce a film or you know, maybe direct or even just do something as, like lighting or anything like that? I'm very happy you asked this question because- That's good, I, have... I just thought of it five minutes ago. Yeah, no, I have. And it's funny because I'm like, he read my mind because I'm going to try to bring this up too. Actually, I forgot to, but so I'm happy you did. Um, I actually have, I associate produced um, the Girls, Guns, and Blood movie that I played Kitty in. That was my first time learning, you know, like what it takes to like promote, market, um, just like hire people, cast. And then in this recent film that I did, it was low budget and we were working under constrained conditions. You know, a lot of people might not have been wanting to go back to work, but we still needed to get this done. And so I um, was able to step into shoes. My part was very small in this one. It was a very challenging, juicy role, but it was very small. Mm -hmm. And because I've known the directors and the um, producers forever, they asked me, they said, you want to keep on working even after your part's done? And I was like, heck yeah, I want to keep on working. So I stepped in to help second AD. Um, and I learned a lot from that. But the bigger thing I did, and this is what when you say making a movie is everything, um, I started catering too. And it was my first Ooh. time catering. I don't know if you guys know, I love to cook. That's like half my world. Well, actually, I, I know you have a show now on your YouTube channel. Yes, yes. Make it delicious, you know, and I'm working on another show. But I love to cook and I love to do, I love to show people how to cook and I love to eat and I love when people eat and they're happy. Um, but because this was low budget, I was thinking, 
you know, I can help them out too. It's like, I want to help you guys like keep the budget down. I can take over catering. You know, I can really help out. And they gave me a chance. And I was, I think, I knocked it out of the ballpark. So, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff, like, you know, behind the scenes now. And um, I really enjoy it because I think this is a good thing for me to do because I'm not always going to be, I've really had to kind of um, maneuver my way into a different, you know, um, part of my entertainment life. Because before I was just like maybe a body or like a face or the girl you throw in a bikini. But, you know, I, I, I'm getting to showcase more of my talent now, moving more into my age range. But also what I've realized too, I want to be in the entertainment industry no matter what. And so I love jumping into production now because I see from lighting, you know, to the grips, to the gaffers, to the caterers, to all the amazing PAs, assistant directors, and just everybody that has anything in the supply houses. It takes so much to make a movie and every moving part needs to work well with each other for it to happen. Because one thing, putting a wrench in it, that can be thousands to millions of dollars. So I appreciate so much when you see those end credits, every person, it means something for them to be listed there, you know? And so I hope you all do start looking at the end credits, not just to see what happens or that last thing that's said by that last Avenger, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's hats off to everybody who um, is a part of making production. And that's a big thing too, this pandemic, it shut down not just production, but the caterers, you know, that cater to all the productions, all the locations that would usually be hired out for the productions, sure. um, the florists, the carpenters, you know, um, when one thing shuts down, the movie industry employs a lot of people. And so I hope that people enjoy everything they see because it's a lot of mouths out there, a lot of hands that took part in giving you, you know, your enjoyment. <laughs> Okay, one last question before we get out of here. We ask this of all of our guests right now in the midst of a pandemic where we're all quarantined in our homes and all that stuff. I am wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't it, but thank you very much. <laughs> you settled the claim. You owe me 20 bucks, by the way. <laughs> um, being as though you just got back from a film shoot, uh, obviously I haven't probably had any time, but what is Christine Nguyen currently binge watching? Wow, when I'm binge watching now, I am about to start. Bin well, I started it and I don't like it. Very it's not for me. I started doing Dirty John, the Betty version, but I kind of feel like I already know the story now. Um, the next thing I want to start binge watching. Oh my God, that's a, such a good question. Um, shoot, the other day I just had something on my list. Um, well, I wanted to start binge. I don't have Amazon Prime. I want to start binge watching Hunters because I love Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I don't have Amazon Prime, so maybe I have to get on to getting Amazon Prime. But that's the next thing I want to binge watch because I hear it's really good. I heard that's really good, too. That's on my list of uh, shows to binge watch in the future. Yeah, and it's not too far in that I can't do it, like, yeah. in, like, you know, just, like, a week or yeah. maybe, I don't know, two days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Christine, this was amazing. You're amazing. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today um, as a repeat guest. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show and hanging out with us and having a few laughs. My pleasure. Nothing but love. See you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hope to have you on again in the future. Definitely maybe before football season or maybe sometime later in the summer. But uh, again, it's uh, you're awesome. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on once again with us. All right. Much love to you guys. Thanks right. so much. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Yep.